Okay, it's five o'clock. It's Think Tech. It's Community Matters. And guess what? This is Senator Sharon Moriwaki. She joins us from the Capitol building, the Square Building, not too far away. Hi, Senator Moriwaki. Aloha, Jay. Nice to see you. Nice to see you after all these months. I it's don't know. It's true. I miss you. <laughs> Good seeing you. I haven't you. seen you in a while, but that doesn't mean I don't hear from you. I, I, I hear from you every day, sometimes more than once. Oh, yes. And, You're on my, on my uh, messaging every day, my message out to my community. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I can't remember any elected official that was as ardent as you are about your community, about, um, you know, connecting with your community. And uh, the day wouldn't be the same if I didn't get your newsletter, honestly. Uh, it's really remarkable. You must have people who absolutely love hearing from you and learn by it. And uh, you're kind of our neighbor. You're our collective neighbor. That's what you are. <laughs> well, you know, I had monthly chats before and since COVID and, and uh, are unable to congregate. And my restaurants, one of them is still open, but they're closed which is very sad. Uh, I, I took to um, emailing my um, district so that at least we have some connection during this time when we're all shuttering and shuddering. <laughs> yeah, I saw that Nobu's is going to close. Uh, that was very that's really sad. sad. I mean, I walk my district and so little open and some open and then closing. Uh, it's, it's this up and down as well in terms of these emergency proclamations from the governor and from the mayor and people just don't know what to do. And it's really tough on businesses because they have to uh, follow all the protocols and in, in sanitizing and social distancing. They have half the number of, of customers. So, you know, you bring back your staff, but you have half as much income coming in. So it's really tough. I really um, try to support them as much as I can. Oh, it's hard. So yeah, and your district covers Waikiki, which Waikiki. is sort of like one of those, it's, it's like Aleppo in Syria, you know? And, and Kaka'ako too, because you know, a number of the restaurants have opened up in Kaka'ako and it's really for the community, but but Waikiki is so hard hit. It's it's very, very sad. So, you know, tell us about the session. It was, a, I call it the Swiss cheese session because uh, it was on again, off again. What, what kind of experience did you have uh, over that session where it was on again, off again? It was, it was um, a stressful session. We thought last year was stressful but this year it was very stressful it, because we had, we had um, no game plan. You know, there was nothing really to follow. It was the first ever, unprecedented as they say. Uh, and we, we had the um, idea that we would go because it happened in the last, uh, I guess the last week in February. So we had the idea that we would go till about April and we would conduct all the business that we could and then uh, end early. But what happened was one of our own um, was diagnosed with, uh, with COVID. So everybody, we, we shuttered right then, and that was in March. So much of our work was done uh, remotely. Uh, we decided we, there was, uh, there's fa two phases. It was the first staunch of money that came down from the feds. We allocated those funds. And then we said, okay, there's another, another um, phase that's going to come in and we'll come back and we'll, we'll look at how we can allocate the funds to make sure that the money got into the community. So most of the bills that were pending and the resolutions pending this uh, before we, we recessed really are still pending. Uh, very little was able to get passed. All, all focus was on on, on the pandemic, on bills that we need to have to help us through with policies and also um, the allocation of funds so that it could get out into the community. Yeah, yeah, if you don't, it, it was uh, for a while, it was put into the rainy day fund and, uh, and the, the consensus was if you leave it there, it'll have to go back to the federal government. So got to spend it well, by December. Sure. 
And rainy day fun was was there. We put it there because it was untouchable except by the legislature because we were not sure on the first phase that all the funds were going in places where they should be going. So we wanted to make sure that if we put it there, we would spend that three weeks in between mm. to talk with the community to see where their needs were, that we would allocate funds where the need was greatest, you know, like unemployment insurance, uh, rent assistance, uh, and child care support. So all of those um, um, decisions in terms of the allocation of funds was done in this three week period. So we didn't want to send the money out and then have it just be misspent or not spent. Mm. So oh, that's yeah. what, yeah. So, so uh, was there any bills, I mean, COVID or otherwise, that you would have liked to seen pass this year that, you know, got, got de deferred by, by COVID? You know, the, rent, the, the real estate investment trust has been something that, that um, we've been going at it for a number, of a number of years. And that was passed uh, by the Senate. And it was over in the house and it passed the first committee and was going to the second committee. It, it was lingering there. And, you know, I think that as, as we look at it, that is, that would have taxed all corporations in the state equally and not just <clears throat> giving an exemption for those that are off, off, um, off state. And, and, you know, when looking at who's making who's generating their revenues, it, it is these REITs because they really can still charge the rent to their, um, to their, uh, to the businesses, the small businesses and so forth that are renting from them. They're still charging the, the rent. So they aren't really being hurt as some of these other businesses, those are their tenants that are being shuttered, you know? So that's one that I would have liked to see mm -hmm. pass that we would have been able to generate more income for the state yeah. in this yeah. time. Um, the, the, the others are the, the elder services. Uh, um, that, that went by the wayside uh, because we had some funds for elder care, but not for the, the caregivers. So that went on the wayside. Um, there were a um, number of smaller bills. I think the rent supplement bill, we had a big bill for rent supplement. Um, and, and so we put that into the, the, um, the federal relief fund and the governor at first cut 50%, but by error, um, we're gonna get the whole hundred million dollars, but it's still, it's still not released. And that's what makes me so upset is, is that we had rent and mortgage supplement um, funding from the CARES Act and that we worked with the community agencies and, and both the House and the Senate agreed on, on this package that uh, uh, would have gone to a third party um, um, uh, contractor so that it wouldn't get stymied in, in government, you know, it would be out in the community. And that still hasn't gone out because budget and finance, attorney generals, getting their hands on it instead of just letting it go as it was planned by people who are in the know on how you get funds to to people in need so uh, it's very it's very concerning about what's happening with the administration um, it's not moving fast enough it's not moving as if we were in uh, uh, an urgent emergency situation yeah and it, uh, really frustrated us especially um, um, you can see the House and the Senate um, have been frustrated by the slowness of this administration to act. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, of course, uh, you've been following in your newsletters, reflect that in detail, uh, the, the, pro the progression, to use that word, of COVID. Um, the infection, the infection rate, the, the, the lethality of it, the effect on the community. Um, and uh, there, there, there have been some uh, bad press for the administration in the past week or so um, involving, um, you know, a failure to test, a failure to trace, a failure to even hire the people necessary to do those things. And I, I wonder how that plays with the legislature and with the committees that you're on. Well, you know, it's nothing new to the 
I think the House is well, I can't speak for the House, but for the Senate committee, we have been harping on the administration for for months now, since March, April, June, um, to get testing up, to get contact tracing up, um, to look at how we can we can assure that we've got enough people set up to do the tracing and to, to contain the virus that we're going out. Now the governor, um, his first his first proclamation was in early March, and we had single digit cases. And today, five months later, we still don't have the the, the system set up for um, how we deal with not only the testing, but the whole system of testing. And, and if you find positive cases, you trace all the contacts within 24 to 48 hours of your, your finding. And, and when we went and, and talked to the nine contact tracers, uh, they're investigators, but they're doing contact tracing because they haven't been ramped up. Uh, that was a couple of weeks ago. I think they're making changes now. Um, we're finding that some of these people have a hundred cases. How do you do that? So they're not getting to, to, they're not tracing and contacting people within the standard, which is 48 hours max. It's taking a couple of weeks or even more. So of course that spread is going to be, be, be uh, moving out into places that, you know, they haven't, they haven't yet contacted people. So um, it's, it's a very sad state of affairs that during these five months that the Department of Health has been telling us, yes, we have the contact tracers, we push them to get more. So they put two and a half million dollars into the UH budget so they could trace, uh, tr uh, train the tracers. And I think the monies were let in June. So by July, they had some 400 people trained. And we, we said, well, where are they? Well, yeah. they walked through the hiring of these people. And then, and then Department of Health said, well, you know, even if they're trained, we have to now train them. So, so you know, you're wondering why when they didn't, that they were training at UH, that they not take their people over and, and co-train at one time, you know? So when you hear these kinds of things, Jay, you know, it, it's just very frustrating and we try to help and support the administration. But uh, when you get this kind of feedback and you find out that they're not being forthright with you and they're saying everything is fine, but it's not, um, you know, we really, we really are starting to, you said we had to look for ourselves and, 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 I have to say for the record that uh, the day before we went over there to Department of Health, we did talk to Dr. Park and we said, how many? And she said, I have 105. We said, well, we've heard otherwise. In fact, there was a grievance uh, from their contact tracers and HGA was, was, was um, investigating. So we knew that, that there were not 105, some of these people, these nine, were um, you know having 50, 60, 100 cases, and how can you do that with a with that every day coming in? It's you know it's like a treadmill. Yeah. So um, so we said, well, you know, we're going to come over and see for ourselves. We'd like to come over and see it. And Dr. Park said, oh, come anytime, <laughs> you know, please come. We'd love to have you. So we went, and then you know the director um, of health, Bruce Anderson said, you know, how dare you come? The governor said, how dare you come? You know, you've got to give us notice. And um, it, it became more than what it was. We were going over to see, okay, what do you have? Where can we support you? You know, like unemployment insurance, you know, going over there, seeing how, how tough it was. How do we get people over there to help you? How do we loosen up the bureaucracy to get people there? Um, we, we went over to UI and uh, unemployment insurance and saw that they had not enough people. We met with uh, uh, the human resources department. We said, look, find all the people who are working from home, not essential workers, no computers, send them over to help unemployment insurance. So from the 24 people they had, uh, you know, we sent people over from the legislature uh, and 
all of these volunteers went over that they had something like 500 people then trying to you know get this burden of the 200,000 cases which still wasn't enough so the same thing with contact tracing we said you know use the convention center do something that's proactive and bold and get those people there that you need we weren't there to go over and investigate we were there to help and it just became i think blown out of proportion we we want to help yeah but as i as i understand it uh, Bruce Anderson and the governor were not happy that you were there. On the other hand, whether you were there to help or just to do oversight, um, you have an absolute right, if not a duty, to be there and do oversight. What is going on here? You know, well, our jobs. That's our job. That's yeah. our job. Not to mention that all of us, not not those on the committee, but many more of our our colleagues, were all getting these calls from people. You know, why aren't you doing this? Why is this happening? You know, I got, I, I, I was um, it, it tested positive and I was with somebody who tested positive and nobody's calling me. And, you, you know, it was, it was chaos in the community, whereas we're being told we've got it under control. Um, and that's not right. And no. it's, it's well, it's not worse than that. It's not effective. And it leads to more cases and more fatalities. Simple it's, as that. Hey, we have triple digit cases every day. Every Still. day, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, well, it, it, it seems to be down a little today, unless I missed my guess. It, it was yeah. uh, doing a, you know way over 200 there, and now it's down to less than 200. So that's a, a good it's news thing. But, but what do you think has to happen here, Sharon? I mean, you're on it, you're on it, and you communicate really well with your constituents. But what has to happen to for us to get down to a manageable, you know, suppression of the curve? Well, I think that the biggest problem is that people are going about, and you can be an asymptomatic carrier, but people are going out, and and sure, the Department of Health is is truly, I mean, it it is one of the ways you prevent is you stay in place if you're sick, you wash your hands, you sanitize, you you mask up, you keep your distance when you're in, in a congregate settings. I mean, all those are, are good and well, but you still need a health system, a public health system in place. And we don't have that, it seems. So it's from the time, so, so Dr. Park's system worked, you know, with a small outbreak, you know, you, you've got uh, uh, the, the, the testing of this person, you, you see that, you know, they got ill uh, and, and so then you do the, who did you contact with, you know, we have close contact with, you go, there's 10 people, 15 people, and you, you, you find out what the source of it, you know, okay, it's Genki Sushi or whatever it was, right? But, but this is like hundreds, and now we're up to 6,600 that were, you know, affected. So you've got to have a public health system. And so it's the testing and doing more testing before they, they, they didn't do as much testing because we didn't have the test kits, but now we have the capability and we have um, the, the consultants and the testing facilities that are already there in place that just give them more funds and get the equipment to test more broadly. You test, then, then you, you, you get the cadre of, of, of contact tracers and, and get them in, in place. And so when you get you get an outbreak, you, you, you know, you can send people out immediately within 24 to 48 hours, you've got people there and you can contain it, you contain it. And so then you don't have this community spread where you don't know where it is. And now then they say, oh, because of privacy issues, we're not going to tell you where it is. So <laughs> the community is, is scared stiff because they don't know if it's the neighbor next door or somebody in their building uh, when people really should know enough so that they can be aware of what is around them, be much more mindful, and everybody can be part of the, the solution. And so this lack of communication, lack of a system in place, lack of transparency, how many cases do we have? How many hospital beds do we have? How many ventilators do we have? All of that needs to be a system and it has to be conveyed to the public so we all are in this together, really. 
And if Department of Health is, you know, doesn't have the capacity for it, they should tell us, you know, because the funding is there, Jay. That's the sad part of this. They had $50 million. We also had CARES Act money. The money is there. It's just the allocation of the money into places that it can be used immediately. And you know, these CARE Act monies, they go away at the end of the year. So time is, clock is ticking. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you saw there were uh, two long op-ed articles in the oh. last couple of days. Oh, My no. doctors, epidemiologists uh, over this sort of thing. And one, one of them covered the issue of privacy and said, what, what is it with the privacy? Nobody wants you to reveal the name of the individuals. We just yes. want to know the demographics, the neighborhoods. We want to see a breakdown of the data. That's not a violation of any privacy. Right. So, right. Uh, yeah. And, and you know that, that there was um, a report that um, said that, that we have, among all the states, we have disclosed only 13% of useful information that the public really needs to know about this pandemic. And, and I think that Department of Health has a, has a, 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 what they call the Joint Information Center. They have a group of communications people. They have contracted out millions, I think, or hundreds of thousands of dollars that they really need to come up with, with the plan. And they even have, um, um, a way that that they can let the public know of vital information, you know, that 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 people are all trying to do the right thing. It's just not knowing what it is, and it changes from day to day mm -hmm. without a rationale. You know. So so um, you know, you said that there there were going to be or there are now changes happening. What what are, what are what's the nature of those changes and? Uh, it's a good time to, to make those changes because we're still in the middle of it. Uh, next January, when the legislature meets again, hopefully it will meet again in January, um, it, it may be late and legislation may not be the solution. It may, it may be kind of a negotiated result with the, the oversight that I was talking about. So what, what kind of changes are happening or could happen now? Right now, it's... it's, it's um trying to, to fix the problem of the contact tracing because that's immediately necessary. Uh, we, can't, we can't go hobbling around with you know, nine or 10 or 20 or 40 contact tracers when there's this kind of spread. So, um, so we had recommended that they use the convention center because the uh, unemployment insurance crew is kind of winding down. So now you put in the contact tracing crew and, and ramp it up to the 400 that were trained. And there's a lot of community support from the Hawaii Pacific University, as well as the University of Hawaii, right. um, to, to really bring in whoever can help to help. And this whole um, effort now, I, I just saw today that there is um, a surge testing, that they're going to start do, doing more widespread testing in the community, which has been really, um, for me uh, and many others, um, a concern because we could test up to, we were told, 5,000 a day, and we were testing maybe sometimes not even 1,000 a day. So I think the testing needs to go up. Um, they did hire a new um, 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 disease, it's a disease investigation branch, which oversees the contact tracing, investigation contact tracing, um, Emily Roberson. And she started, I think about three weeks ago. Um, uh, she's a faculty or former faculty member from HPU. So um, maybe that will help with new eyes, fresh look, a more public health orientation. Um, hopefully that will work. So that's one of the changes just in, in terms of, of staffing, but hopefully she will have the authority to move quickly and do the kinds of things that need to be done uh, to make this a real public health system. Mm. You know, so this is supervising the testing and tracing, I take it, yeah. Yeah, and, and so bringing in the new hires and training mm -hmm. them, 400, uh, I think she's spending her time now at a convention center trying to set up that whole um, 
um, contact tracing unit. Yeah, what about the information? I'm, I'm reminded of an article that appeared in Haaretz, which is a, an Israeli paper out of uh, Tel Aviv, um, where they, they gave you an example um, in the paper of how much information the, the, the government is giving to people. And it was really something. It was the whole enchilada. It was everything. I mean, there are no names, but a lot of information about what was happening in COVID. And it's a parallel situation, except, um, you know, we ought to have a parallel information available to us. Is, is that going to change? Is that on track? We've been urging them to give us that information. You know, again, they're very cautious. So everything goes past the Attorney General, um, Department of Health. But I think that this whole sphere of HIPAA and FIPA um, is, is pretty much, to me, this weighing of individual privacy versus public health interest. And we really need to look at the public health interest at this point. And the information is not Joe Blow living, you know, uh, in, in one water for a tower. It really is in Kaka'ako, you know, there's this uh, three or four cases or at this the school in, in this area so that people know that they need to know um, so that they can be much more aware. And, and if not, at least Department of Health can call all these people in the contacts and make sure that it is contained so that, you know, it, it really isn't spreading. Um, I had um, uh, a situation in, in my district where, and this was an elderly building, that they were not told that uh, someone had COVID. So they locked everything down, not knowing what the situation was, not being able to tell anybody that, you know, we have COVID or at least it's contained. Uh, and so everybody's fearful because the, the, you know, coconut wireless works very well. So you might as well say what you can say to protect the interests of everybody else. I mean, it's yeah. like up. a lot of people are, are saying, well, you know, it's my constitutional right to do whatever I want to do. I don't need to do this. It's a hoax. Well, so be it. But if masking up is something that's very neighborly and, um, and, and a, a way to show that you care for your neighbors, then mask up, you know, what's the problem? It, it really is a matter of community. And that's what I think um, really needs to be stressed in these times that we're in is that we are a community and we really need to care for each other, you know. Uh, you've always said that. You said that a long time ago, Sharon, and, and uh, you've been faithful to it. And you've been faithful to this issue. Uh, uh, and I guess I, I, I would ask you, I mean, I, you intend to follow this going forward. It doesn't sound like you're going to let go of it. No, in fact, in fact, um, you know, the session is over and the COVID committee and, and both the Senate and uh, Speaker Psyche on the House side, uh, we're continuing to meet because we haven't seen the kind of progress. You know, when we, we quarantined uh, at the airport and we said, OK, we closed loopholes, we closed loopholes with uh, short term rentals, we closed loopholes with um, enforcement, we closed loopholes with uh, you know, the Uber and, and the, the, um, um, the car rentals. And then we, we circled back and, and we we're hearing from uh, Angela Keene and, you know, the quarantine breakers. Oh, that's not happening. There's all of this violation still going on and HPD is not, uh, it's not uh, enforcing quarantine. Oh boy. So, you know, so, so if it's not us, then nobody could really say, hey, what's happening? And, and you know, at least work with the administration to say, these things aren't happening. How do we help you make it happen? Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you're doing that. You know, one thing that strikes me, Sharon, and I think it's really relevant, is, is that, you know, I, I stay at home most of the time. A lot of people I know just stay at home. And, we get, and we're getting, you know, used to it, to start a new life here. It isn't like the old life, and we have fond memories of, of time, times gone by. But, you know, I'm not going to go out unless I feel confident. I, I have to develop a whole new sense of confidence. And to see those triple-digit numbers all the time, that doesn't give me confidence. <clears throat> now, if I had more information about what was happening, 
I could start developing a kind of personal track on how this is all doing. And I could develop a sense of confidence. That's just me, but I'm, I'm not alone. Oh, I think a lot of people would do the same. So if they saw, and they could make their own minds up, if they saw the data on the, on the neighborhoods, the demographics, all that stuff, um, the, the stuff that's not being reported, then they could, they could develop confidence over time. And, and if you give them the information, then what you get at the end of the day is, is, is a reopening. That right. confidence equals reopening. So to me, it's, it's a secondary benefit there. It's not just a drill. It's if you want to get people to reopen, you got to tell them all, all these things. Am I right? You are absolutely right. I agree with you a thousand percent. And, and, and I think that people need to recognize that, that we're, not, we're not targeting anybody. It really is. And again, it's this mental set that we are a community. How do we make ourselves safer? Even the hotels are saying, we want to do what's right. We don't want to open up until we're really, really sure that we're safe. So everybody's on board. It's just the enforcement and the, the knowing, having the information to do what needs to be done. And so if we have the information that it, whether the, the COVID is here or there in one school or another, that we have the protocol to know how you contain it. So you don't shut the whole schools down. You, you know, this classroom or wherever it is, that, that is a much more targeted um, um, uh, science-based or data-based um, way of- It's the same thing. It's, it's confidence. So if I'm a parent, and, I, and I'm stuck on the dilemma of whether to send my kid back because nobody is going to force me to do that. Uh, I'll chain myself to the front door in my house and you know nobody's going to force me to send my kid back. So I have to have confidence and that information could help me develop the confidence. Uh, so where, where are we on that? Can you just, uh, the, my last question really is, where are we on the schools now? Where are we on the way yes. people feel about the schools? It, it really is not quite um, together. I think the superintendent told us some things and we have been still asking, uh, we have Senator Kidani on our committee and she's very much on top of hearing from the schools and hearing from the teachers. And we all get those comments as well of the fear for not knowing and being having to open up when you're not fully equipped with, with uh, protective equipment, you're not fully equipped with with uh, sanitizing equipment, not um, uh, equipped with and, uh, how you social distance your classroom if you're getting people back in. And especially those, um, uh, what they call the special ed programs where students need to come back to school. These are small classrooms. There's no accommodation on how do you social distance? How do you give them the necessary protective gear? Uh, they will need gowns and you know gloves and everything else. So it's not really well thought out. So and it's not consistent across the board. Um, some teachers, a big issue the other week was telework. Some teachers, they're all doing social distancing for a, a week until they, they get themselves, you know, for maybe even the quarter, but until they can learn the system and how you have it really safe for all the kids and the teachers and the staff. Um, it's a learning, but, but, you know, I think part of it is not having the protocols in place. So hopefully in the next several weeks or months, um, they will learn that that's important to have in place before opening up the schools for everybody to come in. Because with, with kids, especially the younger ones, you can't keep them apart. So they have this concept of a bubble. But, you know, that, even that is hard to, to really uh, be able to manage when you've got all the kids running around and you know, all their energy. So um, we, we also heard that when they bring them in by bus, you know, they're not all masked up and, you know, it, it's, it, it, they really need to have more protocols and a way to, to deal with the, the, the students, especially the younger ones, and how they're going to accommodate them so that they really are safe, given their energy, you know. Well, so, sure, I, 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 answering your question is not quite, quite there yet. It, got it, it. You know, it's still I'm, in front. 
I very much uh, admire and compliment you on, on doing the oversight and being part of the Senate group that does the oversight. And you really have to continue to do that because if you don't do it, then nobody will. And um, I'd be very concerned. And I believe that legislative oversight, and I'm learning this from the federal government, obviously, is very important. And I'm so glad you're doing it. And I really like being your district and, and getting your your um, your newsletters. And I and I, I I would encourage and compliment you on on sending them out. It's a it's a, a real community service that you do. You you're an outstanding senator, Sharon. Uh, I knew you would be, and here you are. And then you come on our show and talk about it. And I really appreciate that. And I hope we can do this again from time to time uh, to learn from you how things are going. Of course, of course. It's always, it's always a pleasure to come talk to you, Jay. Talk with you. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Sharon Rory Waki, the Hawaii State Senate. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Good talking with you. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>